Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. In my previous videos we have seen that certain blocks that make up structures like the Great Pyramid and the Assyrian have been transported hundreds of miles before being placed into their final position. The granite blocks of the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid weigh up to 60 tonnes and were transported more than 500 miles from the Aswan Quarry. The same granite was used for the giant columns of the Assyrian, 200 miles away. And although Egyptologists easily explain the transportation by claiming they were simply sailed up the River Nile, nobody has ever demonstrated this feat before stating it as an historical fact. Scientifically, it is of course possible. Egyptian barges or ships can carry a load of 40 tonnes, and so Franz Lohner suggests that combining two barges with a raft would be more than adequate to transport the colossal blocks of granite. In his model, the raft lies between the longitudinal sides of two vessels, and is attached to them rigidly so that the barges don't tilt inwards from the heavy load. He estimates that this method could transport a stone weighing 80 to 90 tonnes up the River Nile. During the past century, ferries like this were used across Europe on rivers and lakes to move heavy loads, but there is no evidence that the ancient Egyptians had developed this technique more than 4,000 years ago. That is, if you believe that the Great Pyramid and the Assyrian are Old Kingdom, and not far older, which is far more likely. But how do you get the stone blocks onto the raft in the first place? Lona suggests that logs and ropes were used to pull the blocks along downward sloping ramps and onto the floating vessel, which in itself is a difficult feat to accomplish. Steering the vessel would also be incredibly difficult, and then there is the problem of unloading the stone at the other end. He suggests that there were tracks made from logs, with rope rolls pulled by 400 men for each large granite block. I can just about accept the transportation of the blocks by boat up the Nile, but the idea of 400 people pulling them onto the vessels and then unloading them off the boats and pulling them towards the construction site and then hoisting them up high is where I become sceptical. Scientifically, it just about works, but there isn't any evidence to say this happened. And, as we have no idea how they cut the granite blocks in the first place, the builders of the Great Pyramid and the Assyrian were certainly privy to lost ancient technology. In a previous video, I discussed how this lost technology could have been sound, which could have been harnessed to cut and shape granite through sonic vibration but sound can also be harnessed for something known as acoustic levitation. This is a theory that is gaining momentum and is not quite as out there as it may seem, as it has been championed by elements of the scientific community. In basic terms, it states that instruments could levitate heavy objects to make them easy to move. In more recent times, there are stories that state that in some areas of Tibet, Buddhist monks can levitate large stones on the slopes of mountains and move them wherever is needed for building walls, with the help of drums and trumpets. Author Bruce Cathy describes an eyewitness account of many Tibetan monks moving huge boulders with their voices and musical instruments. A German article by Swedish engineer Olaf Alexanderson also describes sonic levitation. He stated that the priests of the Far East were able to lift heavy boulders up high mountains with the help of groups of various sounds. And then there is the work of Dr. Jarl, a Swedish doctor who studied at Oxford and made a journey to Tibet in 1939 to visit the High Lama. The Lama allowed him to observe sonic levitation of huge rocks up a cliff of about 250 metres. Dr. Jarl provided detailed descriptions and diagrams of what he observed, and he even made two videos, 
that were allegedly confiscated from him by English authorities. A similar process was suggested to have been used to build Coral Castle in America, another controversial and relatively recent event. Coral Castle is a structure that was built by the Latvian-American Edward Leedskinin, who said that he discovered the techniques that Egyptians used to build the pyramids, techniques that related to levitation and anti-gravity technologies. It took him 28 years to build the castle, from about 1923 to 1951, but he never revealed his construction secrets and didn't allow anybody to view it being built. He did it completely on his own, carving more than 1,000 tonnes of rock, with some blocks weighing more than 58 tonnes. He lifted such blocks by apparently singing to them. He reportedly sung a scale, until his hands felt a response from the stone, and the sound that produced the strongest vibration was sustained for quite some time, to give the rock a powerful dosage, and apparently the rock levitated. Abul Hassan Ali al-Masudi, an Arab historian, has written about ancient Egypt, and he mentioned the way the ancient Egyptians used to move stone, referring to a magic papyrus that was placed under a building block. The block was struck with a metal rod, causing the stone to levitate and move along a fenced path paved with stone, with metal poles on both sides. The idea is that the metal poles that line the path used to vibrate, creating frequencies that would lift the stone off the ground. I have no idea how he came to this conclusion or whether or not it is true, but the use of metal rods is interesting. I mentioned in my previous video on cutting stones using sound that the was scepter may have been an instrument used in the process, as one of the ends could well have been a tuning fork. But was it actually a physical object that could strike up a resonance to not just cut, but also levitate rock? You may not believe these ideas, but in recent years, science has proved that acoustic levitation is scientifically possible. Researchers have managed to use sound waves to levitate and move particles, liquid, small screws, and even living organisms, such as beetles, and they can move them with precision. Acoustic engineers have developed small, concave, piezoelectric transducers, enabling the generation of standing waves for acoustic levitation. And it is this method, but on a far grander scale, that may have been harnessed by the ancients. During the conquest of the Americas, historian Garcilaso de la Vega documented the destruction of enormous granite bowls at Inca sites. Concave granite basins were also found in the passage chambers at New Grange in Ireland, and most notably around the Giza pyramids. Here, the bowls or basins were generally made from a quartz-rich rock, as well as what is clearly a geopolymer limestone. These stone basins have remained a mystery for generations, but Egyptologists claim they were used in blood collection of ritual sacrifices but oddly, they do not contain any residual trace of blood. They also contain three or four holes near the upper rims of the basins, but not at the bottom, so they couldn't drain the basin of blood. The limestone-like basins have a perfect geometric form and look as though they were manufactured at some point in history, through a mould-making process rather than being quarried and carved in a solid state. You can watch my previous video on the generation of geopolymer stone blocks in ancient Egypt. The quartz basins, on the other hand, were clearly quarried stone. So how were they used? The clue is that the basins were made of rock and geopolymer of a specific composition. They contain crystals that create piezoelectric charge, especially when under pressure or when sound is applied. The theory is that these basins were distributed around the pyramids as part of the original high-walled enclosures that we know did exist around each of the three pyramids of Giza. They have since been collected and grouped together by Egyptian authorities. The identical dimensions and curvature of the many basins 
with perfectly rendered geometric forms and their concentration of quartz and calcite crystals means that they would have been able to work together to focus and amplify acoustic waves. Author and researcher Dr. Alex Putney states that mechanical flexing occurs in the quartz and calcite crystals as a uniform structural deformation that generates standing waves within the stone's crystalline lattice, eventually building a strong electromagnetic field that allows acoustic levitation. Of course, I'm not a physicist, and I don't fully understand the science, but I know enough to see that the idea of acoustic levitation in the ancient world is feasible, and it explains certain bizarre features and superhuman feats of engineering. Today, even the greatest scientific minds still know very little about how to harness the power of sound, but we are making breakthroughs all the time. The great scientist Nikola Tesla once talked about experiments he made with acoustic sound waves, which started an earthquake in the building of his New York laboratory. He recounted how the beams in the building started to shake, as if their molecular structure was being affected. As well as Tesla's discoveries, sonic drilling is now a commercial technique to drill boreholes and hard stone, and acoustic levitation has been tried and tested on a small scale in laboratory conditions. But did ancient people really have this knowledge? Well, it's certainly possible. In summary, looking at the evidence, I do believe boats were used to move giant granite stone blocks up the Nile. But instead of 400 people dragging them onto and off the boats, across the land and up enormous ramps to build pyramids with ropes and logs, I would say it was highly unlikely, and a more advanced form of technology was used such as acoustic levitation. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please hit the like button, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.